Well, good morning, everyone. It's about two minutes after 10. So I think we should go ahead and get going. There will be more people streaming into the room, I'm sure, as we go. Um, but uh, allow me to introduce myself. I'm David Coughlin, the Associate Director of the MPA and Economic Policy Management. Um, and uh, it's, it's a real pleasure to uh, welcome you um, and to, uh, to introduce to you uh, both uh, the facilitator of today's session and our guest. Uh, the still facilitator is uh, uh, Ebuka Emevina from uh, our class of 2020. Um, and he has invited John Kiff, uh, former uh, International Monetary Fund uh, senior financial sector expert to join us and to speak about the opportunities and challenges of implementing central bank digital currencies, which is, uh, you know, a hot topic these days. Um, so I, I think we'll have a, a really good discussion. And I'm going to hand it over to Ebuka to, to lead us uh, for the remainder of the session. And I'll be in the background admitting people uh, and just give me a shout if, if you need my help. Thank you, Abuka, and thank you, John. Thank you very much, David. It's a pleasure to have everyone here this afternoon. Good day, everyone. I am Ebuka Imebina from the class of 2020. And we have an exciting topic before us and also a very experienced speaker. Money as a medium of exchange has evolved over the last 10,000 years from butter, commodity money, more, more, um, commodity money and coins to paper money. And in 2009, Paul Volcker described the ATM as the most useful invention by banks in the last 20 years. Despite the significant importance to the payment systems of ATMs, credit cards, and checkbooks, smartphones have led to widespread adoption of mobile money and e-wallets. Also, distributed ledger technology and cryptography has led to an explosion in Bitcoin and stablecoin usage. Some countries have also um, considered the possibility of adopting cryptocurrency as legal tender. Across the world, and particularly in emerging and developing economies, one positive aspect of the pandemic has been the accelerated rise in digitalization and implementation of dematerialized and contactless payment systems with diverse objectives, including faster, enabling faster transaction processing, enabling cash transfers and financial inclusion, bypassing international sanctions and restrictions, and also encouraging, encouraging cross-border remittances, which the United Nations um, sets the transaction processing fees at 3%, according to the SDGs. So today we will hear from a global expert on the current developments and innovations around digital money. And I will be the moderator for the next hour plus. Um, David has done a good thing introducing our speaker, John Keith, who has had a distinguished career as a senior financial sector expert since 2005, focusing on over-the-counter derivatives, pension risk transfers, uh, and also most recently on FinTech. Proud to his career with the IMF, John worked with the Bank of Canada for 25 years, where he spent most of his time managing the funding and investment of the government's foreign exchange reserves, including running large interest rates and currency swap. So it's a pleasure to have John here with us today. And we ask our participants to be open, ask questions, and also interact and engage with each other using the comments section of this um, link of this discussion. So feel free to connect us across cohorts um, by posting LinkedIn profiles as the case may be. Um, before I hand over to John, I will run a very quick poll and then we take um, the findings and then John would deliver a presentation for the next few minutes. So I believe we can all see the poll Okay, so let's take question one. Could you live without physical cash? Okay, so we're getting responses for questions one and two. Question one, could you live without physical cash? 
interesting responses here. John, you might want to make some comments about these results. Yeah, I mean, uh, the one that struck me as interesting is, um, is actually the, the, the two and three, the focus on cyber risk. If, if I'm doing the same kind of survey amongst a group of central banks, they wouldn't normally um, click that, maybe because they're maybe too cocky. I don't know. They, they figure that, hey, we've got cybersecurity um, under control, so it, they wouldn't click that necessarily. And a central bank, see, so what questions as a central bank, what would be your biggest concern? I, I kind of agree with these results in that it's saying that it should be security, cyber risk should be number one, but most would probably answer something like monetary policy, implementation risk, or or financial stability risk and illicit activity risk. That would be the one. So it's kind of interesting um, that, uh, that, that, you know, depending on the perspective, um, how this works as a user, cy um, cyber risk must be, you know, something that's really high high on your list of priorities. And, uh, number three kind of reflects that that too. Um, one, of, one that strikes me uh, that you might see um, some click in countries where the infrastructure is not so strong, it's loss of connectivity or power to wallet. So if you're in an island economy that's prone to being hit by hurricanes and so on, um, you might click that. That one's being rather important too. But uh, in a way, uh, it, it, the questions are kind of trick questions because they're all important. Most central banks would click all all eight of those those questions for sure. But on on that first one, it's interesting that uh, you know I think we're no matter how digitalized we are, we always carry a few bills with me. I, I make sure of that and hardly ever use them there. They've probably been sitting in my wallet for, you know, a year, um, getting all crumpled and dirty, but uh, I can't remember the last time I actually used cash. But, you know, it's, I think it's the ultimate backup plan. It maybe goes back to cyber risk too. If, if you know, if the system's down or power's out, um, what are you going to use? Um, you know, the cash is your, always going to be your last resort. Interesting, interesting responses. Thank you very much, John, there for your insights. So at this point, I will hand over fully to John to proceed with his presentation. Thank you. Okay. So um, my work on central bank digital currency goes back to probably around 2017 or so. And these two papers that are reflected on the left-hand side kind of reflect, they reflect the the outcome of that work. So the cast and light on central bank digital currency is a paper um, that I was part of a team and this typical IMF stuff, um, the, all, the, all the good stuff from the IMF tends to come from teams of uh, people. So this paper came out um, November, 2018 and, and kind of um, gives an overview, the high level overview of, of um, the considerations that central banks should take into take into consideration when they're thinking about offering uh, the central bank digital currency. The second paper reflected down there is, uh, is kind of down more in the granular weedy level of things. And uh, that was published um, early 2020. And that was, uh, it says a survey of research on retail central bank digital currency. Um, and that's what it is. It, we, we looked at all the different pilots and we, we interviewed um, central banks to find out what they were, um, how they were, how they were viewing um, CBDC. Um, but it also kind of provides a, a view, I think, from the team that wrote this paper that I led that, um, that um, of, of what we think is kind of a best practice um, workflow for CBDC right from the point where you, you're, you just start thinking about it right to the end where you're implementing it. And now mind you, that's 2020 and this whole, um, this world was moving really fast. So it, if we were writing it today, would, it might look a little bit different. In fact, I'm in, in the, the process of, of rewriting. And I, I kind of enjoy doing these kind of presentations because they help me to kind of focus on, on, on the key issues and, and, and helps me sort of think about how I'm going to rewrite that paper as more of a, like a dummy's guide to CBDC. I think that's going to be the final outcome. Um, and then um, what you'll see um, below, there's a, there's a link to my blog, kifmeister.blogspot.com. I'll be repeating that to, at the end of the slides. That's, I, I run a daily a daily blog there where I cover fintech all over the world. And also that's where I post a table I'm gonna show you soon that uh, keeps a real time run in, run in tabulation of uh, central banks that are taking a look at CBDC. But I think I always like to start with this slide because I, I think it's important to 
straight right from the outset, what is the central bank digital currency? What are the key uh, criteria? And in fact, there's three broad, broadly speaking, there's three types of CBDC. There's the retail CBDC, um, which is broadly accessible to the public for general purpose usage. So that's meant to basically replace the wallet in your pocket. Um, well, mind you, I think we'll all agree, we'll also carry some physical cash too, but the, the idea is it complements or replaces that um, and it's for everybody to use. There's one called wholesale CBDC that has a more limited use case and is meant to basically operate among banks and, and, the, and the firms that, that are involved in the payment system, um, things like PayPal and, 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 and so on, and, and all the banks. And so it's very, it's a, it's a, it's, you, as, a general, in the, as a general public, you'll never get your hands on a wholesale CBDC. And then there's something that's uh, floating around, around out there called synthetic CBDC. Um, and that's, that's a, and that, that kind of went back a bit and I have to make sure you're, we're all on the same page in terms of what a stable coin is. So we, I think most of us, are, we should all know that what a crypto asset is, that's like Bitcoin or whatever it's, it's a, it's a, it's a crypto, the currency um, that runs on a distributed ledger platform. Um, and um, so there's this Bitcoin, there's Tether and so on. And I mentioned Tether because that's what's called a stable coin. Well, Bitcoin, its value floats around with respect to the major currencies like the US dollar and the Euro. Um, a, a stable coin um, is anchored to a, a, a major currency. So Tether, for instance, is anchored to the US dollar, it tracks it very closely and meant to be kind of a replacement for um, dollars in, in, in within the crypto asset uh, trading world. And, and like most, most of these um, stable coins, they're backed by assets. So that $1 worth of Tether is backed by dollars worth of, of um, high quality liquid assets. And at least that's supposed to be the case. Um, a synthetic CBDC is essentially just a stable coin where those backing assets are deposits held at the, the central bank. Um, um, and so that gives it kind of a, eliminates an awful lot of risk you might perceive with respect to that stable coin. Because otherwise with a, a, non, a, a, a regular stable coin, um, those funds are typically invested in um, um, commercial bank deposits, commercial paper, um, maybe corporate bonds and so on. And so um, first of all, there's a credit risk to the what's back in the, those, those stable coins. Plus um, there's liquidity risk because um, they might be held in say three month commercial paper, which has to be liquidated if the holder wants to redeem them. Whereas uh, a synthetic CBDC would be backed by deposits, which are uh, demand deposits at the, the central bank. But what we're talking about today is specifically retail CBDC. And the first, the first criteria is it has to be denominated in the jurisdiction's unit of account. So if the Fed issues a stable uh, CBDC, it's going to be um, denominated in US dollars. If the European Central Bank offered up a CBDC, it would be denominated in euro, not some other currency. And that's kind of important because um, some of you may have heard that El Salvador, for instance, is contemplating um, introducing Bitcoin as a, as a unit of account and, and legal tender uh, on their, in their country. Um, so even if that was a central bank that was managing or issuing that cryptocurrency because it's not anchored to um, the, uh, El Salvador's um, legal tender, which currently is US dollars, the, that, would, that, would, that would sort of fail on that account. It's also issued by and a direct liability of the jurisdiction's monetary authority, which is for most people, a central bank. I just say monetary authority because you have in Europe, you have the European Central Bank, um, which is covering um, a, a whole currency zone in the Eastern Caribbean. Um, you, the, uh, Eastern Caribbean, there's a group of islands that have got together under the umbrella of the um, uh, Eastern Caribbean Central Bank that uh, also issues, an, an, um, issues a, a, a um, CBDC, and it's a direct liability, you'll see it on their balance sheet. It, and, and we say backed by the jurisdiction's monetary authority, and that sounds like I'm saying the same thing again, but that's meant to nuance that to synthetic CBDC, which is not issued by or a direct liability of the monetary authority, but it's backed in, in that the, um, the stable coin is backed by deposits at that uh, central bank. And then another important factor for retail CBDC is it has to be broadly accessible to the public for general purpose usage. So they shouldn't have to, you know, go through some kind of exchange or something in order to, uh, um, in order to, to, to 
transact or, or to, to take on CBDC or, or, or redeem it for cash. Then you'll notice in a lighter shaded gray, I have, gray, I have available 24 seven and used for peer to peer transactions. And this kind of reflects the, the fluid nature of the CBDC world right now. It's uh, at one point I might've had that dark shaded, but there might be some out there who don't view that to be an essential characteristic of a of a um, um, the CBDC. And an example of that be would be the Swiss National Bank, which which um, published a paper on CBDC design, and their proposed design didn't include peer to peer transactions. That all transactions had to go through um, a merchant or some kind of some kind of point of sale um, device. Um, to me personally, I think it should be um, it should be near as near as possible substitute for cash. So it should be available twenty four seven, and it should be used for for person to person transactions. And then there's a, another one below it, which that used to be an essential characteristic um, legal tender. Um, and it, it was a requirement, and I'm on the verge of knocking this one off the table because it kind of gets covered already in that top line, which is the it's denominated in the jurisdiction's unit of account and. Also, I'm influenced by a paper that I have a whole bunch of references back to, um, that, that will give um, the um, links and so on to the papers that are, I think, are rather important in this area. But uh, there's a IMF's legal department published a paper, which to me threw a lot of doubt on the idea of a, of a digital currency being legal tender for, for one thing. And we're seeing this argument come up in the case of the El Salvador situation that to be legal tender, that means that uh, all, all, all merchants and, and so on are obliged to accept um, that currency um, for payment of obligations. And that's a fairly strong condition because especially in the digital currency world, you can't count on everybody being able to do that. Like if you're in a country where um, the smartphone penetration is only 50% and you've got a CBDC that runs on smartphones, you're basically locking out half the population. So the legal tender distinction kind of fails on that basis, but shouldn't be an obstacle to saying to offering up a CBDC that's denominated the jurisdiction's unit of account. Now, on the next slide, um, I want to go. This, this is we're going to quick enough. So, let's, um, the Marshall Islands. You may have heard about the Marshall Islands adopt. They, first of all, they they've been running with the U.S. dollar as a national currency and legal tender um, since. I guess, World War II. Um, the Marshall Islands doesn't have a central bank. Now in 2018, the, the, the parliament passed this SOV Act, which declared the, this forthcoming crypto asset, uh, um, the digital blockchain based crypto asset called the SOV would be adopted as the Marshall Islands legal tender. Um, and the act goes on to say that the SOV will be issued by the Ministry of Finance by an initial coin offering, which is kind of a funky way that crypto assets um, get to, get to, get um, um, offered into the, into the market. So I've got a quiz for you now. So is the SOV a CBDC, a synthetic CBDC, cryptocurrency, or stable coin? 60% thought it was a synthetic CBDC, 20% um, thought it was a cryptocurrency, and 20% thought it was a stable coin. So I'm gonna, uh, the right answer actually is the cryptocurrency, and I'm gonna go in there now and let's wait a minute. Okay, so um, does it? Why? Why is it not a CBDC? First of all, the SOV's current unit of account is the U.S. dollar, so it, it fails on being denominated in the RMI unit of account. Now, I suppose that the the the, R, the Marshall Islands government could say, well, the SOV that kind of makes it into the unit of account by making it legal tender. So you know, we'll I guess we'll we'll might give them that. That, that point, but is it issued by their central bank or monetary authority? Is it direct liability? Is it backed by monetary authority? And first of all, Marshall Islands doesn't even have a central bank or monetary authority. So it, it can't even have that. The CB part of CBDC doesn't even apply um, there. Um, and so it's it, it, because it's only issue, it's issued by the, um, it's actually issued by a, a private nonprofit foundation well, maybe it's a profit. Actually, I think it might be a profit seeking foundation that's working with the, the finance um, ministry. So it fails big time on those three. Um, the other one is not really broadly accessible to the general public because it's going to only be 
um, purchasable through licensed exchanges. So it's, it's kind of like a, when you would trade Bitcoin or something like that, you have to go onto some kind of exchange um, to, um, to, um, to purchase and sell it. All it does pass the available 24 seven um, and years and may be used in peer to peer transactions. So um, that's, that's the um, story on the Marshall Islands. So just as we would say, like with the, um, in the case of El Salvador, that wouldn't be a CBDC, even if the central bank um, was, was actually somehow um, offering it, it, it wouldn't be, it's not based on the unit of account of US, the US dollar. Um, so um, that, uh, that's why, that's the story behind, behind this SOV. I mean, the SOV is actually a prospective currency in that uh, it hasn't yet been um, issued. And in fact, there's been a change of government since that act was passed, it's rethinking the whole thing. And I could go. I could speak a lot about other issues around that. Uh, going back to my IMF days, the IMF is not a big keener on on the Marshall Islands. So let's move on. So first, this is this is my tabulation. I keep this one up to up to date on my um, on my on the blog I, I posted earlier. And there's 57 central banks that I I I've tracked down here. They're um, offering or planning to offer or thinking about offering CBDC. Um, and these are all based on publicly available information. So you'll often hear about surveys by the BIS and even the IMF that, that, that actually say that a lot more um, central banks are contemplating issuing CBDC. Um, and that's because um, they have access to inside information that uh, and I'm, I, I don't, I can't know about that. Although I do know about a dozen or so that are planning to offer CBDC or thinking about it that uh, I can't put in here because I want to stick to my guns here. As, being based on, on publicly available information. So it kind of breaks the, them up into several groups. Um, first of all, at the top, you've got five central banks that have either launched or piloted or soon will pilot um, a CBDC. Um, and then you've got five under that that have done or will soon do proof of concepts. And it's kind of important to get those two terms straightened out. A pilot is where the experiment is conducted live with real people, real merchants. A proof of concept is typically a, a very closed um, experiment. Like for instance, Ukraine did a proof of concept where they involved only their their staff, the, the central bank staff, and a few merchants were brought in. So it's they actually called it a pilot. But when I talked to them and said challenged them on those definitions, they said, "Well, yeah, okay, it's really a, it's really a proof of concept." But you can see at the top that the Bahamas actually fully launched already. The Shan dollar um, launched in October um, last year. Um, and then the, the, other, the other four in that group at the top, they'd be the completed pilots, that's the Uruguay, they've completed their pilot and are now considering the um, results and contemplating whether to proceed further. Um, and Jamaica is gonna be launching a pilot this month, they say the Eastern Caribbean has launched a pilot. And there is, a, I think if there's eight islands in under the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank um, umbrella. And they, they, they're, they've, they started, I think, with the two or three islands and they've moved up to another two recently. And, and eventually I think the idea is to keep expanding the pilot. And if it works out well, to switch it over to a launch. And of course, China is the most visible and, and, uh, and famous of the, the, the CBDC piloters. They, they started something like a year or so uh, ago. And it, the, they, it's a, they've been piloting, it's more like multiple pilots in different cities, different types of products, different conditions. They've experimented with offline um, CBDC. Um, and uh, so it's, uh, it's quite an extensive, um, extensive experiment. And I think the idea is to lead up to the, the, the final pilot is aimed to be at the um, Winter Olympics, which is um, the, and after which they'll evaluate whether to go ahead. And then you've got your five um, countries that are done um, proof of concept or soon will and in, in, that, in terms of African countries, you'll see Ghana is one of the leaders in that area. If you go down to the bottom, um, these are see all the all my information in the in the first four groups. So those, those are all based on all those links will take you to a central bank website. The the one in that group that has Nigeria and highlighted down there, um, you know, Nigeria is not is a very shy central bank. They 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 don't really post much about their experiments on there their web page. So that comes from a, a newspaper that they seem to particularly favor. And that's, you have to follow this particular newspaper to know what's happening with the Nigerian experiments, but they're planning to do a, 
a PLC very shortly, and maybe even do a pilot um, by the end of the year. <clears throat> and then in that third group, you've got ones that are in advanced stages of research and development, and development, and so they haven't quite done POCs that we know of. Although I suspect that some may have. Um, um, sounds when you read between the lines, it seems like Canada and the Euro and the European Central Bank may have done some kind of limited pilots, but they haven't published anything on that. And you see some kind of African countries there; they have a very advanced. Uh, um, they're in the very advanced stages of research and development, and you know, I wouldn't be surprised to see them doing a, a proof of concept or a pilot um, sometime very, very soon. They're also working very closely with the IMF, who provides technical assistance in this area. And then there's that group, that big group in the middle, um, where the banks are, central banks are still very much in the um, exploratory stages. Um, I put the, the years behind all of these things because. So in some cases, you've got to wonder, you know, are they still active like Iceland? Last time they spoke on CBDC was 2018 to say, eh, I'm not sure about this, maybe not, um, but, but they haven't published anything um, since then. So whether they're still puttering about, who knows? Um, again, I'm just scanning here for um, African countries. We've got Eswatini. They have a very active um, um, research program underway. Um, we've got Kenya. Um, they've got, they're also, um, doing some, some research work in this area. And they're like many of the central banks in this group where they're framing it more as a contingency plan. And I think that's why I think there's, it wouldn't surprise me if almost every central bank is thinking about CBDC in some way, because when we get to the motivations later, you'll see that, you know, you can't just, you can't just wait until the problem that would possibly motivate issuing CBDC pops, because there's a lot of work involved in, in, in them offering up a CBDC design and, and making sure the infrastructure's in place so you can't wait. So Kenya would be one of those you know, contingency plan um, countries. And you've got Madagascar, Morocco, or, um, have, um, they have active programs underway. And uh, when I say active, I, I just look at the date. If, if they're publishing stuff on their webpage about CBDC experiments in this calendar year, it means they're, you know, they're, they've got some pretty serious stuff in South Africa. Um, They've got a, a ver they've had an active um, retail CBDC research program underway for some time. It kind of went went to sleep. Back, um, I guess in 2020 they they actually had a request for proposals they sent out in 2019 to look for partners to work with them um, from the private sector on CBDC. But they they kind of put it to sleep through 2020, um, mainly for the usual reason, right? The COVID. Plus they had some budget issues that, and they decided to focus their efforts more on wholesale CBDC. And then you've got Tunisia, they've, they've, they're, um, they're, that's one where you put a question mark because the, they haven't been active since 2018. But uh, um, you know the, the, the little elves that I listened to tell me that they, they're still actually out there um, um, experimenting or, or, or at least researching CBDC. And you've got that group below uh, there's um, ten banks there that are that are, um, I'm, I'm the, the information comes from pretty reliable sources um, and the, the, but they're um, and these are doing some some degree of research but because it's kind of coming from it's just newspaper articles reporting on speeches or or reporting on question Q and A sessions with various uh, central bank governors and so on it's uh, you don't get much detail on what they're doing but um, you've got uh, and You've got Nigeria in there as one of the, and Rwanda is also reportedly um, doing some research in this area. And then at the bottom, there's the central banks that have launched and discontinued. So Ecuador actually had, um, well, this is one of these ones that might disappear off my table. It's, I'm, it's arguable it's not even a CBDC. I've got to do a little more, a little more work on that before I decide, but it has been called a CBDC and they ran a CBD, this program from 2014 to 18 before they canceled it for lack of interest. And then there's Finland. They also had a, they also did some experiments with the, actually not experiments. They actually had a real live CBDC they launched in 1992 and then canceled it in 2006. And one little point I'd like to make, you'll see that, that Finland was active in 92 to 2006. And you might say, wait a minute, you know, Satoshi didn't do his thing till until 2008, isn't, isn't a CBDC all about um, distributed ledger technology and blockchain? And that's an important point I'll make 
probably several times in, in the, today that uh, it, it doesn't necessarily have to be based on distributed ledger technology. It could be based on a conventional centralized ledger like the kind used for credit cards and bank accounts and so on. There's a number of different technologies that can be used for CBDC. But like I say, this table I keep live on my web page, on my blog, and I update it. Seems like every every couple of days these days because there's just new developments taking place all the time. When I started this table back in 2018 for that paper I mentioned up front, I think there was only about a dozen um, central banks on there. So now we're at 57, and maybe maybe in reality there's there must be like 100 or so countries that are looking at CBDC. So in terms of motivations, I like to divide the world into emerging market developing economies, which I think would be mainly what we're talking about here today. Um, and then there's advanced economies. So in terms of the EMD economies, mo um, Buka was talking about um, the financial digitalization and often CBDC is framed in that same, same, in that same place that CBDC is seen as a way of ramping up financial digitalization and inclusion. And that's, that's, um, that inclusion has can have various dimensions. It could be simply um, that the, there's the, the banking sector is not offering up digital products that are really up to scratch. And that's one that was discussed in the Uruguay context. They have, they have banks and so on. They have financial institutions, but they were lagging on the, on the digitalization front. So they thought they needed to get in there and, and sort of push that, um, that process along. And so in terms of inclusion, it could be, sometimes we talk about inclusion about banking the unbanked and, or offering the unbanked payment, uh, digital payment means. And that's another important one too in, in, in countries. And that includes you know, going to advanced economies in the US, two million or so people in the US are unbanked. So that's often brought up as a motivation um, to offer CBDC. Another important one, and again, this is especially true for EMD countries, is reducing the physical cash costs and risks and building more resilience into payment systems. And for smaller countries, um, the cost of producing um, counterfeit to resistant um, cash, um, banknotes and so on, and distributing them is very, very expensive. I imagine there's, the, there's a lot of fixed cost in designing counterfeit resistant um, um, physical notes and so um, that that would and, and there's also risks in, in managing that and that I, I like to bring up the example of the eastern caribbean central bank who um one of the risks they have is that they, they've got to transport money uh, across open seas to the various islands and so literally have to go with the caribbean and that they see um digital currency as a way of of, um, of reducing that cost i've heard in brazil that's another important motivation in their thinking. Also, it's a big country, a lot of places where they, they have to transport cash across fairly dangerous territory. So they, they see um, uh, fiscal cash management and, and security um, as, a, as an issue that drives them towards the CBDC. Another one, um, we call it reducing currency substitution. That just, that's just the code word for dollarization. So a lot, a lot of countries, um, People in the, the the people in the residents and the citizens um, prefer to use somebody else's currency. It might be um, the U.S. dollar or the euro. Um, in some cases, it's it, it's a fear of Li, Li, or I keep choose, losing the, the name now. DM, which used to be used to be called Libra. That's the Facebook proposed stablecoin. That uh, if they offer that globally, um, many fear that that, that could that could also increase the amount of this currency substitution takes place. Which currency substitution. Um, reduces the central bank's monetary sovereignty. It makes, them very, it, makes it very difficult for them to, to run monetary policy. Um, even, the, even the Bank of Canada has, has said that that is one of their contingent triggers um, for issuing um, the CBDC, that they, um, that, that they fear that a private sector, they always frame it this way, uh, a private sector um, means of payment dominates to the point where the Bank of Canada can't effectively run monetary policy. When they say private sector means a payment, I think they're all thinking about um, DM. And another one that um, comes up too is fighting tax evasion, money laundering, and other illicit activities. I just added this one because um, it wasn't one that was coming up a lot until very recently. But uh, the idea is that you know we, we know that tax evasion 
and and other illicit activities cash rules this that's the most that's the most effective um, way of flying under the radar screen and so and then of course the and nowadays, Bitcoin and, and privacy focused cryptocurrencies are also playing a role in this. So the, the idea is that it replace, is the central bank hopes to issue something that will, um, first of all, reduce the amount of cash in the system, which is being used for all these bad, bad activities. Um, and then the other, other one that's, that's more controversial is they would like to offer CBDC um, that allows them to see what's happening. It's basically, um, um, Making the C, design the CBDC so they can see who's doing what, and that's of course very controversial because um, you know most cash users that one of the reasons they appreciate cash is it's um, anonymity, and there's good and bad reasons for that. You know, so that one could think, oh well, that's not that, that why is that bad? But you know, we all have our own reasons for wanting some to have no way of not not seen by the authorities or or family and friends and so on. So. Um, that's 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 an important. It's becoming a more important um, focus. I'm a bit dubious about it because um, if for those users that are using cash or Bitcoin or whatever um, for its anonym, anonymity or pseudo anonymity, um, are they going to are they going to switch over to CBDC because it's there? We'll see. Um, the other the other um, one that comes up is improving payment system efficiency, and that kind of relates to um, the one up top reducing physical cash costs and risks and resilience, but it, it's a little broader than that because um, in the case of countries like China, where um, WeChat Pay and Ali AliPay um, dominate the uh, dominate payment system, um, this fears that the, the monopoly that they have um, could reduce the, the the efficiency of of their offerings, and and uh, there might be some monopoly abuse, which kind of relates to one of those advanced economy. Motion, um, motivations I have at the top right hand corner um, and, and, and in countries where cash usage is declining, there's that fear um, that uh, they're, they're, there's, there's going to be a loss of um, access to central bank money, but also um, monopoly distortions that, um, that, that might come into play. That, uh, another important subset of the, the efficiency argument is also um, there's hopes that CBDCs can be created. So they're Somehow interoperable or, or operate cross border, and that way they could possibly um, reduce the cost of remittances and so on, which would be important to a lot of African countries. Um, I think the catch there is that um, in order to make a retail CBDC um, cross border work cross border is very challenging. Um, there might be a bit more to be there might be more to be gained in focusing on focusing on the wholesale angle, which is the one that most, I think most uh, the efforts are being placed on improving the, the cross-border rails at the wholesale level, which is where all the efficiencies, inefficiencies are right now. But designing a CBDC for cross-border usage implies that the, right from the start, you're thinking about how can it be used in other countries. And that means probably working with other central banks to make sure the designs are similar. But so far, from what I've seen, um, there's quite a diversity of platforms and designs out there that um, kind of go the other way, away from something that's kind of standardized enough to be useful for cross-border, but it is something that you'll hear many central banks um, aspire to when they talk about why, why they're looking at CBDC. Another important um, one that pops up is improving monetary policy effectiveness. Um, that could involve things like um, allowing the central bank to access granular real-time payments data so that they can, they can feed that into their macro models and monetary policy models. Another one that's important too is the breaking through the lower zero bound on policy rates. Uh, that's probably not so important for um, most of the African countries, but for um, a lot of the advanced economies where they're bouncing along the, the zero bound. I mean, there's it, the problem with, if they can't go into negative rates or it's very difficult to because people can always run to cash and, which has a zero interest rate effectively. The idea is, and this is very popular amongst economists, not so popular amongst practitioners. But the idea is that um, if you if you have a, a remunerated CBDC that pays interest and and you can you can make that interest rate negative, um, um, that allows a lot more flexibility in monetary policy. Catch is that you've got to at the same time either eliminate or reduce or or make cash very expensive to hold because otherwise people just run to cash, and uh, that's a very unpopular. Thing. I mean, I've 
I mentioned this. I talked to this over with my dad. Sometimes he lives up in Canada. And I tell him I have these talks about discussions about digital currency because he that takes up so much of my life, and you know he does not want to see. And I think this might be an age thing that doesn't want to see um, cash eliminated. But I think we all and we saw that in the in the in the poll also. We like to have uh, some cash as a backup plan. So I'm a, as I said before, no, nobody's actually incorporated interest rates into their CBDC. Um, and I think that uh, it's doubtful that we will we'll see that in the near term. In terms of risks, bank intermediation and runs if the CBDC is made too competitive with bank deposits. Um, that, um, that kind of relates to what I just talked about. Suppose you have a remunerated CBDC and, and, you, and, the, and the interest rate on it is set too attractively. Well, you could end up sucking funds out of the banking system, which undermines the banking system's ability to, to lend. So that's, that's, um, that's an important risk. Um, but there's way, different ways of dealing with, with that. Um, what we've seen in practice is the use of holding and transaction size limits. So you can't hold unlimited amounts of CBDC. Another one that's come up is a variable and, and tiered um, interest rates or fees. Um, as I said before, no actually incorporated interest rates into their CBDC platforms yet, but um, many are actually incorporating the ability to do so. And so um, one option, this has come, the ECB has written a paper on this, the idea of tiered remuneration where um, the interest rate would be somewhat reasonable for um, small um, amounts of holdings, but if for large holdings, the, the rates would be very, very low and not very attractive to, and not attractive enough to, for most people to want to pull their money out of the commercial banks and push them into CBDC. The other important thing too, of course, is that in many countries, um, the a commercial bank deposit is already effectively kind of like a, CB, a quasi CBDC because they're backed by um, government or central bank backed um, guarantees. So in the US, um, it's up to $250,000 of our bank deposits are covered by the FDIC. So um, that's kind of almost as, as riskless as it, it comes. The other one that's been put forward is the idea of restricting conversion from bank deposits, but that hasn't flown. It's a bank, Bank of England kind of flew the idea in a working paper some years ago, but um, it's just, go. it would make, make that CBDC so dysfunctional that um, it just not is not no one thought about. Um, the other risk is to monetary policy transmission, but it's when people look at that seriously, it kind of leans the other way that it's probably actually a good thing for monetary policy transmission because it, um, especially if you do make the um, the CBDC remunerated, you could use that variable interest rate to strengthen monetary policy um, transmission, and also just the fact that you're including more people in the financial economy by bringing the CB, effectively bringing the CBDC um, makes them more, them more interest sensitive in general. And the other risk is currency substitution. We talked about that earlier. And really that's more of a risk that points to the major currency um, central banks when they're designing their CBDC. They design a CBDC that uh, can be used for cross, can be used cross borders. Um, it, it, it might actually present risks to other countries to, to basically ramp up dollarization. And that's why there's a lot of work taking place right now um, at the international level, level, led by the Financial Stability Board and the Bank for International Settlements there um, in the IMF too. They're all involved in some major work on, on how to design a, a CBDC that's effective and even effective for cross-border usage that doesn't, uh, doesn't ramp up the risk of, um, of dollarization or euroization. And then now we're going to get into some of the nuts and bolts. So there's there's a number of key design choices that need to be made. And what, maybe one of the very first ones is, is whether it's going to be a single or multi-tier. And single, single tier just simply means that it's a it's kind of the, when you first think of a CBDC, um, that's this is how you might think about it, that, it, that you're basically allowing individual citizens and residents to have accounts directly at the central bank. So I can imagine the central bank has um, ATMs on every corner. They have um, kiosks where people can cash for CBDC. That sounds all, that's a, that's kind of a more, a kind of a theoretical way of thinking about it, but most central banks aren't well suited or set up to run um, retail facing 
um, operations like that. So um, most of them are, are, well, all of them so far are talking about what we call multi-tier operating models where um, they work in partnership with the private sector. So banks and other payment service providers, maybe in fintechs, um, actually are the point of contact for the for users with that the CBDC. So in the case of China, for instance, their their ECNY, as they call it, would be wouldn't be something you you would deal directly with the People's Bank of China with, but you actually might be holding it in your Alipay or WeChat Pay wallet. That's that's a typical design. And I guess saying nobody seems to be looking at single tier. And when we wrote that 2020 paper, we wanted to include an example of a single tier or a country where a single tier might make sense. And we just couldn't find one. I mean, there might, it would have to be a country with a financial sector that's so poorly developed, there's no private sector institutions to partner with at all. And, you know, maybe there, there, you hear about some, there's some countries, for instance, where um, the main, the main um, financial institution is the, is the postal system. Maybe that would be kind of a quasi single tier model. Um, I think Tunisia did some experiments. It wasn't quite a CBDC, but they, they did some experiments with a sort of a digital currency or money system that uh, operated through the post office. You could sort of call that a quasi multi, uh, single tier um, operating model. But for most, most central banks, they have, a, they have banks and payment service providers that can offer up this opportunity to let, let the private sector do all the heavy lifting. In terms of other design considerations, I've, I'm looking to the four major pilots that we have a lot of information on. So um, one question, would there, should there be transaction fees? It turns out in the, during the pilots, um, nobody is, um, is, is, um, is imposing transaction fees, but that doesn't mean that there may not be transaction fees in the future. And one of the important um, sort of design considerations that kind of goes back to the last slide, if you're gonna partner with these private sector payment service providers, maybe there has to be something in it for them. So it's possible that um, transaction fees in the future could be introduced in that um, private sector layer. Um, we'll see, because most people will say, that, hey, wait a minute, um, a central bank digital currency like cash is supposed to be a public good, so we shouldn't have fees. So that argument means towards maintaining zero fees, but it is something that could be considered. Also, it could be something one would might want to have in the back pocket if you have one of these disintermediation um, problems. So people are putting too much money into CBDC versus um, the commercial banks. So even if the CBDC is not interest bearing, you could introduce transaction fees could kick in. Um, to sort of throttle back that that conversion. In terms of access, there's different. There's, there's a few different different models out there, but um, most of them that I've seen so far um, need a smartphone, and that that and that's that could be challenging um, in countries where um, smartphones are not that um, dominant. And that I'm thinking of lesser, lower income countries where you can't necessarily assume that smart cards um, are held by everybody, which is um, kind of why the bank, uh, Central Bank of Uruguay, when they're pilot, um, they also allowed um, people to use basically what they call feature phones to access. Um, but the, in, interestingly, the People's Bank of China has also been experimenting with um, with basically a kind of smart card based um, uh, wallets um, that don't require you to have a feature phone or a smartphone um, and also offer offline access. So there's a number of different access points, but I think I think it, I'm, I'm a big proponent of considering, um, you know, cheap, dedicated devices um, for for access to central bank digital currency to make sure everybody, no matter how how poor they are, they they can they can afford one of these things. And some of these smart card devices are pretty sophisticated, um, and and yet yet reasonably cheap when produced in volume. Something in the order of five dollars a card, something like that. Um, and in terms of offline. That before PBOC is 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 pilot in what they call what Bank of Canada calls a universal access device, which is an offline um, device that uh, um, is very cheap and accessible to everybody. Um, when you start talk about offline, you get kind of um, shades of gray in there too, in that uh, some of them are offering um, offline what they call limited hop offline, which means that when the power goes down, you're not completely dead in the water. The you can do offline transactions up to a certain amount um, with a certain number of hops from person to person before you have to synchronize back with the ledger. And there's a lot of controversy about 
um, about um, offline access. And for instance, uh, this, the Riksbank, the central bank of Sweden has said that, uh, oh, you have to, in order to control for double spending, which is just basically another way of describing counterfeiting um, for digital currency, um, you, you have to have a, a ledger that gets synchronized with regularly. Um, but there's proponents of these, um, these, um, these uh, special devices, smart card devices that say that can be controlled. There's a lot of debate around that um you probably have heard that you know digital currencies can be programmed with smart contracts and so on so far um none of the pilots have invoked that all i think i might have to update this table because i think the people's bank of china has been experimenting with with um, smart contracts and programmable money in some of their pilots um so that's a possibility there's some interesting and exciting things that you can do with smart contracts and one of them would be uh, this is everyone's idea of a great idea, but point of sale tax payment. So um, taxes get collected right uh, at the spot rather than um, later. Um, and that kind of relates back to one of the, my earlier motivations about um, controlling for um, illicit uh, activity, including tax evasion. Um, also, there's possibilities of integrating with um, Internet of Things applications and also automating just and the distribution of economic relief based on specific other characteristics and talk about central digital currency that can be limited in where you can actually spend the money. So that, um, for instance, when COVID money was distributed in the U.S. last year, people they've done some surveys that show that a lot of people just saved the money and there's or they bought they bought crypto assets and so on. But um, you could design it so it could only be used, say, for groceries and other other things. I mean, that's that's controversial because. Um, who wants to have a, a form of cash that has um, restrictions on it? But it's something that this has been considered. Um, in terms of cross-border usage, none, none of the pilots are experimenting with that right now. Um, although the, the Central Bank of the Bahamas has done it kind of kind of direct indirectly because they have off, I think they've partnered with either MasterCard or Visa to allow um, Bahamian Bahamas citizens to um, spend their sand dollars when they're abroad using their their visas and mastercards in terms of platform type um there's there there's some the two of them the eastern caribbean central bank and the the bahamas they're both using the distributed ledger technology platform private permissioned um and whereas the um, central bank of uruguay is using a centralized ledger which is as i've said before is kind of the le, uh, the same platform that banks and credit cards use with People's Bank of China, I'm not too sure. They issued a white paper a few weeks ago that that kind of I found kind of like a riddle. Um, and so it's it sounds to me like they're they're using they might be using something like um like um they using this a central one kind they they're multi tier so they might be using a hybrid where they're using distributed ledger technology on one layer and then centralized on another. And I think the idea is they, they might be using DLT for the layer that's between them issuing and the and these partners actually distributing and managing the currency and the, the, those distributors and managers are using central. But it's it's still kind of a mystery. Um, they they have issued no no really comp you know detailed um, white papers on the topic. And then of course the there's the there's a need to comply with the the um, FATF, um, anti-money laundering and countering financial um, um, terrorist standards. And, and that's, you know, well, I've, I'm, I'm pretty active on Twitter and some people will say that's, that, you know, the central, that's a, it's a political decision to, to, to comply with these standards, um, maybe, but it's, I think most, most of the respectable central banks um, feel obliged to um, make sure that their design complies with the with these these standards, um, they, otherwise they get their wrists slapped by the IMF, and that's not a not a good thing to be on uh, on on that um, that uh, that red list. But there there's different ways that uh, one can control. For them. I'm just going to skip uh, to this one here, which gets down to the nuts and bolts of how they're actually doing it. So again, we're back to our favorite four pilots, and 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 then. The, Generally speaking, the way they the way they comply is that they they may they may offer some what we call KYC light know your customer um, light versions of their CBDC, um, but they have very very strict limits on how much you can hold in there. So 
for instance, um, the People's Bank of China. That's uh, that's kind of a classic one. All you need is a SIM card, and and you and you don't need a bank account or anything. You can get low limit access of um, of two thousand um, CNY per transaction, five thousand per day. But then you, you can see how it ramps up if you if you go for the version of the currency that's where you give your full name, phone number, and, and also link it to a bank account. You get much higher limits, and that's a pretty common theme. Um, that a, a link into a bank account is the only way you can get the really high um, levels of, um, of access and also offering up uh, usually some kind of photo, government issued um, photo ID. Um, that, so that, that's, that's, that's typically how, how they're all doing it right now. But the, you can see that almost all of them require some kind of, um, some kind of tracking on them. Now the data access on the right side, that, that, that's important too, because that describes the different ways that they're um, they're controlling the anonymity of the transaction data, and the the, the People's Bank of C um, China have their have what this is a they call it controllable anonymity, where um, the PBOC sees the identity of all the users um, um, when they sign up, but uh, users have the some ability to control what information they expose to who, and so that that gives them some control. But I think in that case, the PBOC will ultimately see everything. Um, then on the other hand, Uruguay, um, what they did is they segregated the um, information so that the private sector players that are running the user facing activity, well, they, they do get to see um, the user identity and they see the transactions just like they do when you're, you're spending on a credit card or, or spending money out of your bank account. But the central bank can't have access to that data unless they, they, they get a, a court order. And to get a court order, they have to have probable cause that they're something fishy going on because they see the they see the anonym, anonym, anonymous data only and that's kind of a that's kind of a common theme i think to um the other other central banks too so it's, bahamas is a similar uh, kind of um kind of a regime too where there's uh transaction transparency to the central bank only when there's suspicious activity seen i haven't seen the details of how they actually the team deem that to be suspicious, but the typical typical um, mode would be to get a court order um, in order to break that um, that um, crypto um, encrypted data. And I haven't talked much about technology. I mean, I mentioned it sort of passing, but one of the one of the um, one of the sort of mantras that we that we when I was at the IMF we we would say all the time when we're given central bank digital currency assistance and this is and this is the world economic forums decision making process they they've, um, they've published a toolkit that's i think is a really good uh, sort of workflow for cbdc thinking and you'll see that the decision as to whether you're going to use um distributed ledger i.e blockchain or or what whatever kind of technical platform you're going to use it should be about the last decision you make and that's you can see it's number 10 down at the bottom there the, the first the first phase is really important is to be is to start out very agnostic and determine first of all you know what what needs what kind of um, what kind of what is the problem you're trying to solve um, is CBDC the only way to solve it and in many cases it may not be it may be that there's ways of tweaking the, the payment system or or there there's just different uh, there, there's there are many different considerations that you make in that first layer is just steps one and two and after that and then when if you pass that test then you're into the more interesting stuff i guess in the cbdc realm which is the deciding what kind of form it's going to take um and and then move, and you move down the list in terms of designing and um, and evaluating risks and so on and then finally at the bottom you get down to the implementation strategy which is that's where your pilots and proof of concepts come in, but uh, I'm not gonna spend much time on this slide, but if I were given this presentation um, to a group of central bankers, I might even put this slide up front to pound home the idea that there's kind of an organized workflow that's um, particularly, um, I think, important. That, and it, I think the biggest message is you start with problem identification, evaluation of alternatives, if, if that results in you going down the CBDC path, there's an awful lot of design and risk thinking to be done, um, after which you decide on what, what technology platform works best for you. And there's different types of platforms. And, and you'll see here, this is the, the, these are the ones that have been actually chosen. It's that right side, the, the, the Bahamas sand dollars based on a, 
on a distributed ledger technology platform as is the ECCB. China, we don't really know. And Uruguay went with this Roberto company, which is a centralized um, database. I'm just gonna flip back here. Um, and you'll see that even amongst the DLT platforms, um, none have opted for a public or unrestricted um, blockchain platform. I mean, they, they've all chosen ones that uh, would be, we'd call them um, private permissioned type of, type of networks. And that's just, the, you know, the, the CBDC is, the, is, is one of the crown jewels of the central bank, and they're not going to give control over that to just anybody. So it's, they, even when they do opt for a DLT or blockchain-based platform, um, they're going to put a lot of um, controls over that. And with that, oh, and then this is just my list. This is my uh, my running list of the, all the different kinds of platforms that are that are out there. There's a whole lot of based um, ones, the fewer centralized ledger ones, and then there's these token based ones, which offer up these um, platforms um, that that um, can can offer up offline um, peer to peer transactions without necessarily syncing up with any any ledger. But you can see that the, there's an awful lot of players in the DLT space on them. Um, you may have heard of like R3 um, and uh, Ripple is the first fairly um, well known in that area. But um, there's that right hand um, column, which is that important that's the claimed transactions per second. And that's kind of important. If you, you want to scale this thing up to be useful for everybody, you've got to be able to pump out a lot of transactions. And so um, I'm still working on that one. It's um, I, I would call that column a work in progress. And when I published this on my web page, I've got lots of suggestions for other um, evaluation criteria that might be considered when deciding which of the of these platforms to use. And that's the end of my of my discussion. And the, you can see you can, if anybody wants to subscribe to my um, my um, posts, my daily posts. There's my email address, and then or just simply head over to my blog and um, follow me on Twitter if you want all the, all the sort of unvarnished parts of, the, of my FinTech thinking. We'll stop there. I don't want anybody have any questions. Thank you very much, John. It's been a very informative session, I must say. Um, the takeaways are very significant. Uh, thank you for your knowledge and the time shared we also thank all the participants and now we look forward to questions please feel free to post in the comments or the chat um, chat um, section or you can raise your hands and then we take we take questions actually Vuka, i have a question for you um will this uh, if i send you this presentation you'll be able to um share this in some way because there's um i was going to show you that there's one last page that i think people might find interesting this is my collection of favorite references okay and people might check that out so i'll send you the presentation and then if someone uh, or they can just email me directly through that um my my um email address there and i can make that available and definitely i'm sure david david can um, make that work okay oh yes yes i can make sure too thanks again john yeah. John, I, I think we also have some polling questions at the end, which I probably can put up while participants yeah. come up with questions. So not a lot of them um, cryptocurrency fans here. <laughs> also, there still seems to be a lot of trust for, for the banks and remittance platforms. Yeah, I think Another interesting angle on that, though, is I mean, the, the hope is that through the efforts of the Financial Stability Board and other, and the IMF and others, um, one can hope that in five years the cost and convenience um, will be greater in the conventional rails, like the bank transfers and remittance platforms, because there's a lot of work underway, as I said before, on the wholesale dimension. So um, it could be that even though people 14% said CBDC, they may maybe the future might the future might be such that the, the, there actually will be CBDCs playing a big role in the transfers they do, but they won't know about it if they're using wholesale CBDC. So that might you know that conceivably could be part of the part of what will make um, these kind of legacy traditional cross border payment rails more more efficient in the future. Like I said before, I, I don't I'm a 
dubious about the idea of um, you know retail CBDC um, being designed so that it's easy to, to transfer money. It may maybe it might be the case um, that one of the major currencies, like you, if, if the digital dollar comes to fruition and it uh, it is cross border enabled, I suppose that could become a remittance rail that would replace the current rail that would be transferring U.S. dollars. But if you're trying to get it, if you're in a country that's not using the U.S. dollars as primary currency, you know, I, I just don't know. I just wonder how that would work for re in the retail CBDC world. But it could, a wholesale CBDC could um, could make those the conventional rails that people use right now a lot more efficient and, and speedy. So, John, I would want to ask a question while we wait for the other courts. Um, and that would really relate to international efforts at the global level to coordinate for interoperability, which you mentioned earlier. I mean, so if countries build CBDCs in silos, how, how, how do we ensure that some, at some point they're able to speak with each other to achieve their goals? Yeah, I mean, that, that requires a degree of standardization that we're not seeing develop. But on the other hand, the, I'm part of a, um, a, a working group um, at the International Telecommunications Union. So almost nobody's heard of them, but the ITU is a, an agency of the United Nations and they set standards for telecommunications. And they have a, they have a project underway to look for um, the, the standardization criteria for digital currency in general, not just central bank digital currency, which you know might hold out some hope of, of providing that standardization, but it, it's brutal stuff. I mean, I thought when I started out a few years ago, I thought we'd converge to something really quickly, but we're still you know deep in the weeds here, trying, and we keep discovering new new sort of um, elements of the standardization that need to be incorporated because you need to you can't unless you do have that standardization. Who what as a, as a CBDC developer, where are you even going to start? So you're right; they're all working in silos and. Uh, and um, and rather and sometimes rather secretively, like the PBOC, their 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 degree of transparency is pretty poor on this. Uh, I think the the Americans they they claim they're going to offer up a very very transparent process. So they've got the the, the Boston Fed, for instance, is coordinating a process they're rolling out with the with MIT um, that they say will be a that. that there, anything that these these for the digital dollar will be open source and available to everyone, which is that I mean that's one way to go. If if some common uh, common group offers up offers up a platform that every anybody can use, that would be a good foundation for that interoperability. It, interestingly, also the, the the Gates Foundation runs something called Mojo Loop that uh, um, they are now thinking about. Uh, um, offering up as a CBDC platform, and that, that's another way to go. But you can see already we've got two potential competing platforms. You've got the ITU working on standardization. So I think interoperability at the retail level is probably still a long way away, uh, especially since the retail uh, CBDC design design process or design features, they're richer than they are for wholesale. That's why I keep coming back to wholesale because I think you've got less moving parts with wholesale that uh, that there's more hope that you can standardize that than standardize in retail. Because you know some countries will prefer that theirs be run on this platform or that platform. Some will want programmability built in, others don't. The ones that do will have different different smart contracting standards. And it'll it, it's uh, I think that interoperability at the retail level is um, a long way away. And, and the problem is the, kind of the horse has already left the barn for in many cases, everyone's already well advanced in their thought process. I see someone's shared the, 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 the Central Bank of Brazil's webinar series, then that's a, that's a good, that's, that's a very, they've got some interesting things happening there. And they're being, they're one of those central banks is very, very open about their process. So that's, to me, I think that's a best practice thing that central banks should should be running this process as openly as possible. Thanks for the presentation, John. I'm Ren from the same project group of uh, ITU two years ago. Okay. So, yeah, very nice seeing you here. Yeah. Oh, okay. Ah, okay. There. 
there I and am. we're still going strong many this two years later we're still going strong are you still part of the itu work uh, i'm still following the works with the um, the now they call fiji something i'm still following the works but i'm not really doing that much as before and uh, yes thanks for uh, this presentation and, uh, i think it's like uh, very similar with what we did before and I, I, I would like to ask, um, because like during this pandemic, I think the digitalization in all area has been, you know, phenomenal. So could you please update a little bit from the, for the CBDC compared to 2017 when we started? Also, uh, what do you think, um, like something like USDT gonna be influenced um, in, in this area? like a stable coin like USDT. I mean, I, I feel, I just feel like, um, you know, um, people's mind has been changed. Like the whole phenomena is like, you know, even if our concept is still the same, but you know, the whole world has been changing a lot. So I want to know, yeah, what do you think about this? Thank you. Yeah, I think COVID, COVID is definitely driving, is a big driver behind the sort of acceleration of interest in um, digital currencies. In general, and uh, 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 and in terms of like the top, since 2000, 2018, when we published that first paper, we had I think maybe ten or so central banks looking at uh, CBDC. Now we're at fifty seven, and I think we added probably added about ten fifteen names since the pandemic started, and I suspect there's more. I think that I keep saying that so many central banks are working very secretly secretively and uh and so you know i we if we real true um timeline of, of central banks um looking at cbdc they would have gone up a lot in 2020s mm -hmm. through the through the um the pandemic because i think one of the one of the um use cases the motivations that came up um during that was the was this idea of being able to distribute relief and stimulus to um the population and i think that that became a, another big big driver that uh, getting money from the government to the people, with uh, to the people that are unbanked um, or off the off the radar screen, becomes a rather compelling mm -hmm. thing. But uh, and also I think you know as we've seen, they, well, there's, there's kind of two storylines on cash, right? The 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 amount of cash in circulation almost everywhere you look is going up, going up a lot, but doesn't that doesn't fit well with the with the storyline that actually people using cash is going down. And it turns out that when you get into the details, um, that cash in circulation trending up, it's mostly um, large denomination bills. So in the US and Canada, it's $50 bills and $100 bills. You can kind of guess where that, that money's going. It's, it's, not, it's not being used for payments. It's being used as a store of value, it might be used, used for illicit activity, I don't know. But um, the CBDC is not, is not trying to replace that use case. So um, I think I think there's been quite a drop in, in most countries of the actual use of cash because of the COVID um, thing that uh, the, the transmission of, of, of germs and so on is a big, big um, concern. And what was your other question again? There was two questions. In there. Like uh, some something about CBD, uh, not CBDC, USDT, because I saw some crypto, crypto stable coin, they kind of have a, um, interest rate generated like 0.15% if you just put some money I don't know if it's USDT or I just forgot like some stable coin that um, you know uh, um, oh my god my English is I, I know what you're talking about yeah, yeah the, like, some stable coins um, you can earn interest on them by staking them exactly. onto, onto DeFi platforms and, uh, right. and there's a number so that offer that. Right. And for me, it's like very similar. So they can mimic like the similar thing as they just put a safe, stable deposit in the bank, but it's on a cryptocurrency platform and you can exchange that into other cryptocurrencies. Do you think these two uh, like USDT and the CBDC eventually can be merged? Because for me, it's like it's very similar. Why, why do we have two things? Well, the, the merger point would be in that first um, that first slide of mine where we had synthetic central bank digital currency. That's essentially um, USDT or USDC, but instead of being backed by by 
um, commercial paper, commercial bank deposits, and so on. It's, it's backed by central bank digital currency. And in fact, um, DM, they, they're, they're, when they launch, they're, they'll be backed by, um, they're going to be backed by US Treasury. Their, their, their first iteration is going to be um, a US dollar um, backed stable coin for general purpose use on Facebook platforms and, and so on. And it's going to be backed by by um, um, treasury securities, treasury bills and treasury bonds, which is pretty risk free. But they've said that actually what they really prefer is that they would they would really prefer to just park that money at the central bank um, in the form of a deposit there, um, possibly remunerated. Um, and that that's nice too. But uh, they also but they have also said that if a central banks offered wholesale CBDC, they would embrace that too. And they would then not not be you, they wouldn't have to go into the market and buy um, commercial um, U.S. Treasury bills and so on. Because there's a risk when you hold hold um, U.S. Treasuries as a liquidity risk. There's the the you know the credit risk is very low, non-existent really. It's like a risk-free asset. But um, a, a, C, a CBDC or a a, a, a um, stable coin um, should really offer immediate redemption into or conversion into. To cash or whatever you will want to convert it so, so into, cash will be still be existed for a while. It's, uh, it's yeah. Well, it's, the other reason why USDT and USDC exist is that they they fuel the, the sort of this parallel financial sector that define the DeFi decentralized finance sector. And so I think right. that they will right. always exist. I mean, I think they would all they probably would all prefer that the central bank make um, their Make their balance sheet available, basically their their deposits uh, to to give to allow the stablecoin issuers to deposit into the central bank. Although in the case of Tether, I would put a question mark on that because I think um, it could be that their business model requires them to take some credit risk in order to earn, make money. Because that you know it, there's I think. I think it's a challenging business model, the stablecoin business model, because you know, as you, if you if you you and I decided we're going to launch a stablecoin, an asset-backed stablecoin, um, where how are we going to make money on this thing? If if we um, say we were offered the chance to park our the, the back-end funds at the central bank zero interest rate, well, it's a losing proposition. We're not very interested yeah. in that. Um, all and I think I suspect that with with other other asset-backed stablecoins that the same math comes into play. Like they should, in theory, like Tether should be holding just treasury bills and, and short-term treasury bonds. It may, it may be deposits at very high quality commercial banks that might be okay, but the, the rates that they're gonna earn on that, how are they gonna, how's, how's Tether gonna make money? Uh, the company Tether is gonna make money issuing um, um, USDT um, and how will Circle make money issuing USDC if they yeah. earn almost nothing on the back end assets, uh, the uh, DM is different because they it's going to be part of the Facebook empire, and they can basically they will earn they will earn money indirectly by the fact that um, it's going to ramp up um, businesses done on their platforms and so on. So their 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 math might be a bit different. They they don't really require themselves to make a lot of money on offering DM. They're making money by the usage of DM, but Tether standalone they they. They 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 have to fund their operations somehow, so they they they're employed. They're they're kind of drawn into taking more more risk than than maybe um, we would all prefer. But I think that there might be some convergence. As a, that's really what I'm saying. That eventually, there might be some convergence in, in this sort of synthetic CBDC world, and 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 it might just come by way of legislation. There was an there was some legislation introduced last year called the Stable Act. I don't think I think it kind of fizzled out, but the main point of it was that regulated stable coins, um, US dollar backed stable coins would have to hold their funds at, uh, at high, in, in the form of high quality um, securities like um, treasury bills, treasury bonds, maybe some of the agency, US agency securities and, uh, and um, commercial bank deposits at highly rated commercial banks might be, might, that would be a requirement. Okay. Yeah. For, like from my understanding, like we understand the difference, but like the regular people, they, okay, this, this deposit is a little bit higher than a bank. Why don't I do this? Like something thoughts like that, because they have no idea what the regulation is like. 
yeah, just I, I feel like it's gonna confuse people a little bit for the two areas. For us, it's totally separate, but I feel like when I talk to some of my friends, for them, it's like whatever makes me the most money and more convenient, I will do it. So I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I worked, I worked through the before and through the last financial crisis, and we heard the same sort of thing uh, around. Uh, some of these interest in securitization vehicles, the they, they, the rating agencies gave them AAA, um, yet they were kind of fundamentally rotten to the core. Yeah. Um, but everything works fine when, like in the case of most of those securitizations, as long as as long as home prices were uh, were rising, um, they were able to hide the fact that people actually couldn't afford to pay the mortgages. And when the mortgage the house prices started to go, there was kind of it tripped a, a vicious circle um, that led to mass. Um, Massive amounts of uh, of um, homes, homeowners losing their homes and not paying their mortgages, and not all and it's like a cascade effect that brought down all of those securitization people. Some of them were really super complex, like there were securitizations of securitizations of securitizations in order to achieve um, these AAA ratings. That so I when I see that I see I kind of see that all happening again in a sense like the way you described it. They people think you know they're only looking at the surface. It looks like it's okay. it's um I can make a lot of money because the interest rates in bank accounts these days is pretty pretty crappy, and uh, mm -hmm. I can earn a few more basis points going into this tether. And it looks like it's fairly well backed. It's one hundred percent backed by U.S. dollar assets. That, so I, I just but I look a little. I mean, in the case of tether, is an interesting case um, because because when you they're not very transparent about exactly what they've been holding. They have become more transparent recently, but there's still, I've seen some stories revolving around their commercial paper holdings. That they're actually, mm -hmm. um, they're not describing what their credit rating breakdown is or any kind of information on this commercial paper. And it's rumored to be um, commercial mm -hmm. paper um, issued by some um, troubled Chinese companies, which oh, makes really? one wonder, you know, so and that's when I start thinking about 2007, 2008 again, and how these things can amplify and become, become self-reinforcing um, um, whirlpools, essentially. Mm. Yeah, I just feel like for the like crypto world, it, ha it has to have a like different mindset for the <laughs> like conventional money is, uh, but for many people it's, it's very similar, yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah but it's- Thank you, thank nice you Ron. Yeah, thank you. Mm. Yeah, thank you. Um, John, yeah, John, just um, one more question. Um, the slide, there was a slide where um, we could see some form of, um, I'll call it outsourcing of the, the technology um, aspects of the implementation. I think um, a number of countries which have launched um, CBDCs like the Bahamas, I think outsourced bit. So I would love you to share or maybe provide some insights on how to deal with the risks, the cybersecurity risks associated with outsourcing. Yeah, I mean, that's a good question because when you run it yourself, um, as, as you do in the first panel here, then you know, you're totally responsible for that, um, that cybersecurity. And in this case, in a, in a two-tier model, you've got two levels of cybersecurity risks. You've got, because the central bank is still issuing the CBDC. So they, they should have top quality, AAA rated um, cybersecurity. Um, and I have fear for that, that level that some of the smaller central banks um, may be underestimating the, the challenges of, of, of um, of ensuring that their systems are are are, are risk free because I mean let's face it if, if someone hacks into their minting operation by which they mint CBDC that's the ultimate counterfeiting machine that'd be massive and and uh, so that they have to worry about that but then they also need to be concerned about this layer the the um, the the second layer that that they uh, they have to make sure that they're imposing high, high cyber security standards on all of the all of the firms, banks, and so on, they outsource that to, I mean, they can't, they can't run that cyber security, but they've got to be on top of it. So that probably becomes another element of the supervision that takes place because, um, and that's another thing I didn't really talk much about that when you operate in the, in the multi-tier world, um, you have to have robust 
supervision and regulations on this layer. And so uh, I, I know from the work I did at the IMF and, and the, some of the work I'm planning to do in the future that one of the evaluation criteria for are you ready to issue CBDC, one of those criteria will be, are you ready? Do you have the right um, cyber, cyber risk um, controls in place, cybersecurity controls in place? And do you have the appropriate regulations and supervision on, on all these things you outsourced? Make sure they're also robust because the last thing you want is to, you know, have a have a have a a break a break in the hack basically that exposes all of the information taking place in this layer. So this, and this layer of concern is is that is that counterfeit counterfeit risk that someone breaks into your into your mint and operation and this and this is a bit different and um, and it exposes people's private information and so on just like we've seen like the Experian in the US and so on. So that's, um, that, I mean, that I'm, usually when I do the cybersecurity part of this presentation, I have one of my cybersecurity geeks on board and they can wow you with all kinds of tech, you know, tech, tech talk and everything. But uh, in, in sort of an overview point perspective, it's, uh, it's, it's as I described, you've got to have two, two, there's two layers that you have to deal with on that, on that front. Okay. So, um, at this point, I think we can call it the end of a very, very um, informative session. Thank you very much, John. You've shared out of your wealth of experience and we sincerely appreciate the opportunity to have learned from you. Um, I would hand over to David, but before I do so, I just want to summarize some of our key learnings. We've learned about the various kinds of CBDCs, retail, wholesale and also um, the synthetic CBDC. We've seen the great, um, the major highlights, the major requirements for a country to be able to, for a central bank to be able to issue um, CBDC. And so um, taking all of it into, into consideration, we've also seen the need for collaboration, um, cross-country collaboration to achieve interoperability and also um, seeing how some central banks have been able to bypass this by working with um, Visa or MasterCard, which are like global credit card companies. So thank you very much once more, John, and um, would let um, David round up. Thank you. Thank, thanks for the opportunity to share my thoughts.